Hi there, come on in, I'm Fred Trost. April is here, well spring is almost here. The Farmer's Almanac, if you remember my prediction last week, called for a snowstorm right on the opening day of steelhead season, and that's exactly what happened. The fishermen were in few numbers out on the streams, the steelhead were a bit slow, but we have a story on tricks and techniques on how you can catch steelhead. We have some statistics, some master angler data, from a computer analysis that'll help you catch steelhead. I think you're gonna find it an interesting show, so stay tuned. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. Steelhead opener, 1984. You're looking at one of Michigan's premier steelhead streams, one that is close to trout fishing during the winter until April 1st when the big rainbow trout come up these waters from the Great Lakes. Some rainbow trout live in streams year round. They're called rainbows and they average a pound or so. Other rainbow trout migrate to the Great Lakes where they feed most of the year, returning to their home streams to spawn. Now these migrant rainbows are called steelhead and they average six to eight pounds, some over 20. You know, Michigan had a blizzard opening day, which drove most fishermen home, except for ones like Mark Martin from Muskegon. Now, he's the guy who caught us walleye during a stormy night on Muskegon Lake last August, along with his buddy, Jeff Pascavis. Now, these were two of the very few anglers we ran into who caught fish opening day. Here's an opening day steelhead, much the envy of most steelhead anglers. Jeff, you guys got two yesterday, two steelhead. What's the secret? Uh, fish hard, Fred, and don't give up. Stay with it. I tell you, with conditions like this, though, it's kind of tough. Most anglers gave up. Yeah, it was a pretty miserable day. It's pretty hard to enjoy yourself when it's snowing real bad and the water's so high, you really can't go down too far to land a fish. Well, the few anglers that have come by have been amazed at your success. This, of course, is a male steelhead that's been in the stream all winter long, obviously, because it's so dark. Yeah. And you say all of the males you catch have the kite on the... Yeah, that's uh, their spawning. When they start entering the stream, that kite starts growing on it bigger and bigger. As it... That's that little knob there on the lower jaw that sticks up, characteristic of the spawning, of the spawning male steelhead. And of course, they'll, they'll, when they go back into the big lake, which they will probably all survive, and after they spawn, they will turn silver again like this one that you caught this morning, Jeff. Yeah, that's a real nice fish there, Fred. Now this does not have the kite on, on her jaw. On her jaw, so that tells us she's a female. Yeah. But these are nice fish. Yeah, that's probably a 10 pound fish there. Beautiful steelhead. All caught on spawn. All on spawn. Now what about this? Here's one that a lot of stream fishermen will recognize being a little brown trout. You catch many of these when you're steelhead fishing? Uh, it depends on the water temperature and how high the water is, but at times we do, yeah. But now the water's high and the temperature is low. Low, so they're not too active. Not too commonly caught. Put a right. nice little brown, a tasty one. Oh, real tasty, nice orange meat. Oh, yeah. Can't beat them. I uh, bet you're getting ready for walleye season, Mark. You ain't kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this is the yeah. man who caught me a limit of walleye at night last <laughs> August. We're gonna do that again this year, aren't we? Sure will. The problems on opening day began melting away on April 2nd. The Farmer's Almanac called this snowstorm to a T, and as much as I like to see the Almanac call it right, I hate to see so many anglers go home empty-handed, and that's what happened to most. Whatever it was, the cold, the snow, the wind, the dark clouds, it affected both fish and fishermen alike. Normally, on the first couple days of an early steelhead opener, you'd see these banks lined with anglers. They come out of the woodwork to catch the first few days of the season, but not today. I'll tell you what the problem is this particular season is we just had a big storm, a lot of rain, a lot of snow. You can see it on the banks here behind me. And what the first thing that this does is bring the water levels up. Now, the fish that are concentrated in the holes have a lot more water to choose from when the water levels are high. Another problem that comes up is that the water is moving faster. And, and just like I'm having difficulty here maintaining my position in the current, fish have more difficulty maintaining their position. Remember, they're here 24 hours a day in this stream, so they want to tuck around corners and under the banks. Probably the third biggest problem that confronts anglers right now, when there's snow on the ground, the air is cold, just like my hands are a little stiff. When these fish are in this icy cold water because of the temperature dropping, they slow down too because they are cold-blooded creatures. But there are a few things, a few baits that you can use that might increase your chances of enticing one of these steelhead, even on a day like this. 
Artificial lures like this Hottentot dig that big lip down in the current and dart and dodge, flashing. Now steelhead don't strike to feed. They strike to drive intruding fish away that might be coming in to eat freshly laid steelhead eggs. That's why they'd hit the tadpole. The steelhead egg, strangely enough, is one of the prime baits for steelhead at this time of year, the eggs from female steelhead. And while smaller fish, especially suckers that come in later in April, they will eat the eggs, steelhead will hit single eggs, chunks of spawn or spawn bags that anglers tie and drift past their noses. A six pound test monofilament leader tied to a short shanked number four or number six hook is a common steelhead rig. It's a small hook, but the spawn bag is small and it doesn't take much to catch a steelhead in the lip once it taps at the spawn bag. Besides, the bright orange color, the odor of the spawn probably attracts the attention of trout because they have very keen senses of smell. Now notice that there's no sinker on the leader, nothing near the hook. The sinkers are on a short dropper which hangs from the swivel that joins the leader to the heavier main line. And in the current, the spawn rolls along the bottom, behind the split shot weights, finding its way over the rocks, around the boulders, but not always. Often it gets snagged and it takes a skillful hand to pull the bait free and keep it rolling, trying to find those steelhead that are holding in the current. Flies that imitate spawn or small fish or big aquatic insects also antagonize steelhead if you keep working these gaudy feathered hooks near the steelhead on their spawning bags. Now that's a good way to instigate a real battle. The main tool of the trade you're going to see in the steelhead streams at this type of year is a spinning rod about oh, eight, nine feet long that's quite limber. But the idea is, is to be able to reach out with a lure or a bait out into the stream and toss your spawn or lure out uh, under a bank or behind a hole. But it's important to have a number of guides on a rod because you have a lot of bending like this. And when you're fighting a fish in the stream and trying to pull it from under the bank, you're gonna want a, uh, a rod that bends and that can provide some resistance to that fish so it can tire himself out. The most predominant type of reel you're gonna see there's also a spinning reel, open-faced spinning like this. And the main advantage is that it can handle very light line. And this line is limber line. When it hits the cold water like this, you want it limber. You don't want it to kink up and hold the coils from the spool. But also, we can take it uh, reel like this and cast out, let it free spool, close the bale. And uh, open-faced spinning reel is easy to use in this manner, where you pick up the slack because you don't often have to cast a lot of line when you're steelhead fishing in a small stream like this. But there's a number of different ways to cast a spinning rod like this. The most traditional cast is the overhand, casting upstream, letting the current carry the bait or lure down through the run. The run is the deepest trough in the stream where the fish like to lie. Now there's not always room to make an overhand cast, so anglers sometimes, when they're in short range, lob their baits underhanded with a pendulum type cast to work their baits back underneath the logs, underneath the banks. Especially when the water is high and the current is swift, you'll find the fish hugging the banks where the flow isn't quite so much to contend with. Of course, the fish like to hide behind the obstructions, which are a lot easier for anglers to catch than the fish. One aid to keeping your hooks out of the snags is experience fishing those exact holes, which means you have to lose tackle in order to learn where the snags are. But another big help to steelhead fishermen are polarizing sunglasses. I bought plastic prescription lenses, which help me see under the glare of the surface, especially with the help of a wide-brimmed hat to keep the sun and the sky from reflecting off my glasses. Now, Bob flips down the lenses on his less expensive Polaroids, which are totally adequate. But without a bill on his cap, he needs to shade his eyes from the glare from the sky. It's well worth it, though, because a pair of Polaroids lets you see down into the water, cutting the reflection of the sky off the surface. Just look at the difference a pair of Polaroid glasses makes when we put them over the lens of the camera. A 
little equipment, a little knowledge, and you can catch steelhead if you fish where they live in April. If you find a bend in a stream like this, cast your bait or lure above the deadfalls, under those banks, and in any deep run that you'll often find on the outside turn of the bend in the stream, that dark water there. And the shallow gravel stretches, right in front of us right there, are where the steelhead make their spawning beds. But approach those carefully because they'll spook. None on the beds today. They're probably in the deeper waters behind the shallows, in those darker runs lying near the bottom. You know what they're doing there? They're waiting for you to catch them on one of these sunny April days in Michigan outdoors. Now, the Farmer's Almanac, remember, called that snowstorm last Monday. This weekend, the Almanac predicts sunny, warm, and showers. That should be good steelhead fishing. It should also be good sucker fishing in some of the early areas. For example, Bell River. This is around Marine City. Frank Riskevitz from Marine City caught this five-pound, nine-ounce red horse sucker last year, tomorrow. So those fish should be in there now. A lot of people comment they don't think that fish is particularly good looking. Hey, you haven't seen anything yet. One of the ugliest creatures you've ever seen is just about to emerge from this ice chest. Go ahead, Tom, take it out. This is Tom Bailey from Lansing, who called me last week and said, I caught something that is, uh, you, you certainly wouldn't call it beautiful. No. <laughs> what is it, Tom? It's, uh, I figure it's mud puppy. That's exactly what it is. Go ahead and set it down there. That's a mud puppy that some people might go bananas if they brought this up. You caught this on, on what? The ice fishing with what? Yes, I had a teardrop. Teardrop? And, and here a wax worm. Now you can see it actually moved because mud puppies do have legs. They're a salamander. It's not a fish. Right. That must have gave you a start when you that pulled it did. up through the ice. I didn't even want to even touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you've gotten quite accustomed to it now. Yeah. Now they don't bite. They're nothing to be afraid of, but they're certainly nothing to look at. Well, that's the mud puppy, and that's sort of the oddity that you got. Last Saturday you were fishing where? Holt Lake. Hey, the fish factory, I always say, that right. produces more big fish. And look what you brought back. What, pick up that bluegill. Look at the bluegill that he caught. How big is this? This right here is about 10 and a half inches. Wow, that's a beaut. And you, whoops, here goes our, our mud puppy. We'll have to pull him back here. But here's a uh, almost equal size pumpkin seed. If you catch one of these, Tom, that is 12 ounces or larger, you can get a Master Angler that's Award that's for that. Right. But you can see it's a pumpkin seed. You knew this was a sunfish right yes. off the bat. The yellowish belly, the red spot over the gill flap compared with the bluegill. Uh huh. How has fishing been this past winter? Ice it's fishing. It's been real you? good. Oh, it has been. It huh? has. Real good for me. You've been watching Michigan Outdoors and see yes. how we've done? Yeah. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> Very poor throughout the year. What's the key to catching big gills like this? Is getting out there. Oh, maybe that's where we went wrong. <laughs> you fishing some of that real bad weather? Yes, I are, have on there. Huh? I've off and on. Off and on. Yeah. We, we did the off, you did the on. Yeah. Well, Tom Bailey, thanks for bringing these fish down and this unusual mud puppy. As I say to our audience, don't worry if you catch one of these, they won't hurt you. But I have some tape I want to show you, Tom. This is of a historic signing just a week ago up at Sault Ste. Marie. This is the group who negotiated the Indian Fishing Treaty. Chief negotiator was Ron Skoog, our DNR director. He is signing a treaty 149 years later to the day when the treaty that started this whole controversy was signed back in 1835. Dr. Skook, let me be the, well, probably not the first to congratulate you, but one of the many thousand. Uh, you deserve our congratulations and, and uh, a job well done on getting this finally resolved after 149 years. Some questions still remain, though. Uh, viewers I talk to, they want to know what's going to happen with salmon, especially in those big ports where there were problems with netting before. Well, as far as the salmon is concerned, uh, there will be no commercial fishing of salmon. We've, we've arranged with the tribes that we'll, we'll have a terminal type fishery established somewhere up in here in the upper Lake Huron, but as far as any other fishing in salmon, that will not be done. These areas are clear of Indian fishing. Uh, the Ludingtons, the Manistees, where we the, had problems before? The commercial fishing for Indians, uh, for the tribes, is basically in this area right here between the, all these lines, this area to the to the west of the Garden Peninsula area, strictly state. Here is a sport fishing area around Manistee, particularly reserved. This area here, too, no nets will be allowed in this area to promote the lake trout rehabilitation. What are you going to do for lake trout? What, or what do you set aside for lake trout here? Refuges for lake trout are here, here, and here. And there's another one proposed for up in here also. 
Uh, are the Indians going to be be allowed to take uh, walleyes and uh, and uh, especially the the perch uh, species too? Not uh, not uh, not immediately. We've made allowances that that if in time do in, in our assessment process if we can determine mutually that there is a fishable population out there, then we will that can be allowed in in certain areas. Now that will be strictly in here as far as. Uh, as far as uh, Lake Huron is concerned, if it occurs. And, and what, about, what about net gear? They're going to be allowed gill nets in all this area or what? Gill nets only in this area and trap nets and no gill nets in any of these other areas. Although if there are fish available out there that our state fishermen aren't taking, they can, they can request to permit the fish under there and we may issue one for trap nets under state regulation, but that's the only way they'd be fishing in these other areas. Should fishermen be satisfied with this agreement? Well, I think the sports fishermen ought to be hilarious <laughs> you know, about it, you know, and uh, I think uh, I think everyone has been pleased that we've talked to also. So it, I think the sport fishermen uh, did very well on this, and I think it'll resolve a lot of the conflicts that has uh, has uh, risen in the past. And, uh, and this I'm pleased to have settled it after a year and a half of being here, and I know how people who've been associated with for 15 years. Uh, and in this agreement's time. good for 15 years? It's good for 15 years. We had a cutoff point at, or a year, around the year 2000. Simply is to look at it again and see if there are any changes that need to be made. By then we'll have a good assessment on, on what the tribes are doing as far as their expansion may be in commercial fishing and also what our state fishermen are doing. Again, my congratulations. Bye. Thank you very much. Job Bye. extremely well done. Uh, thank you, Bob. Well, I think all of the sportsmen in the state owe Dr. Skoog a big thanks for pulling together something that nobody has been able to come close to pulling together in recent history. Hey, but I want to say thank you. I'm excited oh, about it. It's finally great over. Great settlement, time. great settlement. I think it's going to really benefit fishing in Michigan. Now, Bob, we're going to drop back to Tip Up Town, a question in a mailbag from Bevan Clayton of Lansing. He asked about my behavior at Tip Up Town. He says, on your show about Tip Up Town, you were driving a snowmobile across the lake without a helmet. Isn't that against the law? Was I violating? Absolutely. Speaking about your behavior at Houghton Lake, at this portion, riding the snowmobile without the helmet, that was completely legal. As the rest of your behavior at Houghton Lake, I don't want to talk about it. Hey, I think I was exemplary. Uh, you may have been. <laughs> <laughs> no, Houghton Lake, Tip Up Town, a good time, and those, those bluegill are great that we're coming out of Houghton Lake. I hope we catch some this spring. Right now, I hope we also do well turkey season. Let's take a look at a couple turkeys in our wildlife sketch. Very well behaved so far, <laughs> and very colorful. We have a couple turkeys here with us, and I'm not speaking to you fellas, not come on, all the jokes <laughs> have been going around here. We have Brian Gray from Michigan State University, and of course, our old friend Glenn Dutterer from the Extension Service, holding the hen wild turkey. Yep. You notice that, that that's very easy to tell, and the obvious thing is the difference in the heads. The gobbler being bright red and blue, and the hen with mainly gray with a little bit of color. And, more feathers on it, but but look at the tips of the feathers, even in the wing. You see how her feather tips are are touched in buff, right there on mm -hmm. the buff, mm -hmm. right. and his are in black. black. Oh, I see. And oh, so yeah. you can tell the sex of a turkey just by one feather. Now that's up close. Now from a distance, though, this beard oh. right here. This is what's called the beard on a gobbler on a tom turkey, just like horse hair or. Pig right. hair. It's, it's strange stuff. What function does it serve, Brian? It's ornamentation. It's a sexual ornamentation. Well, turkeys certainly have a lot of strange ornamentation. <laughs> I mean, their neck. Like, this is a well-behaved turkey. What is this stuff? That's called the waddling. And that's controlled, the color and everything is controlled by blood flow. It feels like fat. Is that what it is? is it well, it's, it's a fat base, but it can enlarge with blood flow so we can control the size of it. Hmm, well, of course, our wild turkey season is coming up, and the turkeys, I hope, made it through winter okay. Are these birds adapted to the northern, northern climates like we have here? Well, that's one of the things that Brian's investigating. Right, we're, we're looking at the energetics of these birds, because these birds are in areas where, these birds are in the northern part of Michigan where they originally were not found mm -hmm. in, in prehistory, history. And now we're looking at the birds a, 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 a ability to adapt to the winter times up there. Because, and how are they doing? Well, that's what we're, we're finding out. It seems that they're depending on, on uh, agricultural and, mm -hmm. and or artificial feeding systems up there. Let's take a look at the wingspan. Can you lift them up and see the wings on these beautiful flies? 
speed. A full demonstration of wingspan. She's, she's a good bit smaller. Boy, they do have powerful wings. They move much faster in the wild than many people would think. They can get up and scoot away. But these are our Michigan wildlife turkeys. What a wildlife sketch. They have powerful wings too, Glenn. Oh, they just about pulled us off the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful fan tails. Well, something that we're going to be doing more on in the coming weeks here in Michigan Outdoors. But right now, Glenn and Brian, let's take a look at some of the events coming up in our Michigan Outdoors calendar. We have hot oil and electric fry pan, 350 degrees, Very Kathy. Hot. How do we know it's the right temperature? We're going to test it with a bread cube. Okay. Drop a bread cube in there, and how long should it take to brown? It should only take 60 seconds. Okay, well, I'll time it right here. We have It'd about 55 seconds brown. to go. While, while we're testing the oil to make sure it's exactly the right temperature for deep frying the steelhead, I'm going to mix up. What, what we're doing right here is just a basic fry crisp type of uh, deep frying, batter fry basics. And we're going to mix a little bit of fry crisp with, you can see right here what beer does when you pour it in. You can use water, but we like to use beer for mixing our deep frying batters because it's carbonated. Right, it's going to make it fluffier too. It's going to make the batter a lot fluffier for your fish. A lot lighter, and it adds a little bit of a flavor, a little kiss of the hops in here, I guess. How's that bread cube coming? We have about done. 15 seconds. It's done? Yep. Yeah. Well, I'd say... browner than that. Well, now some people... Oh, that is golden brown. So that bread cube is ready. We're going to take some of the steelhead, which Mark and Jeff caught opening day, those lucky sons of guns. Not many people got steelhead opening go day. We'll hear what... There we go. Now this is called shallow pan frying. This is not right. deep frying because we don't have enough oil in there to cover... Or suspend it. Right. Or deep frying. Now you could also use enough oil just to cover the bottom of the frying pan. And that would be just shallow pan frying. But which I think it sticks a lot harder. It's um, easier to burn it that way too. Deep and frying, if you can if you can afford the oil to, to buy enough to put in here. Of course people say they don't want to use that much oil because they don't want to waste it. Right. But you you can get around that. You can strain your oil. Or you don't have to, you can just reuse it again. The strain it, it'll be come out clearer, and if you If you strain it and reuse it, right. it a number of times. Right. Also, don't overcrowd the fish in the pan because it'll drop the temperature of the oil and make Fast. it soggy. That's about right. We're going to have this flipped over real quick, but Kathy, let's take a look right now before we eat this, to a question in this week's outdoor quiz. The question is, the world record bluegill was caught on April 9, 1950. Where was it caught, and how big was it? Quite a bluegill that T.S. Hudson caught. The world record bluegill was from a pond in Alabama. It weighed four pounds, 12 ounces. Go ahead, Bob, take that, that big one right there. <laughs> I'm just noticing had which one. Had your name on it. Yeah, had your name on it there, which one you Hey, want. don't eat it all. <laughs> yeah. Well, here it is, our batter fry basic steelhead. No tartar sauce, no cocktail sauce with it. How is it? Good. What do you think, Bob? A-OK -okay by me. Mmm. Mm. And you're so right. This is just a basic, simple recipe. Mm -hmm. By the time you go smearing tartar sauce all over the cocktail mm -hmm. sauce, you lose oh, all the flavor. Fresh okay. steelhead like this, you okay. don't need anything with it. Other. Sometimes I wonder why we do such complicated <laughs> recipes <laughs> on the do show. Do. Such simple things are so easy. Just some batter fry basics. You can get the recipe here in our Outdoor Digest. Bob, we don't have all day. Could you hurry up, please? This is always one of the more humorous parts of steelhead fishing, watching the anglers as the water gets within, within six inches of the top of their waders. Now, Bob should dip down here in a few minutes. Look at him grab the brush. You gonna make it, Bob? Yeah, I think so. I think I, I must be, uh, I must be a little too broad. I must uh, kind of, you know. You've, you've heard of the Mackinac? What? You've heard of the Mackinac, Mark? No, the Mackinac icebreaker. Yeah. <laughs> this is our version. Look, look, oh, he's taking in water. There, oh, oh, Bob. Bob. Hey, now that's unethical to grab a limb like that. 
That's not part of the mistake of steelhead fishing. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> that was close. I'll take a wet fanny anytime over, <laughs> over what else could have happened. Though. <laughs> oh. Holy cats. Here, you want a hand? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just well, like my undertaker, you know? <laughs> what do you that mean? he says. Huh? Says I'd be the last to let you down, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Bob Granny, you made it. You take on much water? Uh there's not room just... to not room to take on much water. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, uh, not when you have your baits here and everything else. And of course, you know, I wear a lot of sweaters. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me look a little bulkier than I really am, you know. <laughs> Man, oh. I, I can't believe this, though. Oh, I can't good. believe this.